God and His grace to all. Hello, I'm Pastor Jim. You know, one of the great things of life is when you find out that somebody loves you so much like Jesus Christ. And I remember at the age of 24, I put my faith in gospel and He saved me. And you know, as I begin to study the Bible, this person say that, that person say that. And boy, it was really confusing until I finally learned how to study the Bible dispensationally. And now it just has opened the scriptures up. It makes more sense. And that's what I'm preaching about today. And I believe today's message will really challenge you to start studying the way that you should. So let's go into the service. It's already in progress. And I hope that will be a real blessing to you. Always remembered when Ethel Waters used to sing that, right? On the Billy Graham Crusade, and it was great. Always remembered that. She was the result of a rape, Ethel Waters was, and she didn't allow it to stop her in her life, and she went on for the glory of God. She's a great lady. Uh, Romans chapter 15. Romans chapter 15. Today I'm just going to try to teach you a few things if I could, but I think they're very important when you study your Bible. But, you know, I remember uh, the time that I uh, heard the gospel of Christ. And I remember the Spirit of God speaking to my heart in such a way that uh, it was supernatural. And when you get saved, it is a supernatural event, isn't it? I mean, there's something. The Spirit of God draws you. He enlightens you. He convinces you. As they say, He convicts you. And then when you put your faith in gospel, He converts you. And uh, we know that uh, it has to be of God if somebody is saved. A man can't do that. And no church, no ritual you go through, it's only your faith in the gospel and that alone. And I remember I put my faith in the gospel, I was 24, and my life was uh, just completely changed. Of course, you know, the battle begins, the ups and downs, one day victory, next day defeat, until you begin to grow in the Lord, and you begin to learn the things of God. And uh, I remember uh, my marriage, it was a mess, and uh, it was about ready to blow apart. But because of my salvation, God held us together and then allowed us to be able to, to begin to work, and especially me, on what my, what my responsibility was as a husband and as a father and so on. And we've been married now 45 years, and we're so grateful for that. And I just want to encourage you, regardless of what you go through in life and as a marriage, uh, God is a good God, and He just waits for us, and He'll help you in your life and your marriage if you'll just allow Him to do that. But I began to realize, though, that after I became a Christian and I was studying the Bible, I began to look out, and there were so many different beliefs and so many different denominations. Why can't Christians get along? And you wonder those things. You know what I mean? And this person says this, this church says this, and on and on it goes. And the bottom line is, is that most people just do not know where they are in God's program. They just have no understanding whatsoever. So today, instead of preaching today, I'm just going to teach a little bit. And I hope that it will be a challenge to you so you can know where you are in God's plan for today and how to look at the Bible when you properly interpret it. All of the Bible is for us. Uh, we can glean and learn wonderful truths, no question about it, but all of the Bible is not specifically to us. And we have to recognize that when I read the Bible so we don't get confused because those parts are not, that are not specifically to me, I have to be careful I don't make doctrine out of that. And that's what's happened through Christendom. Uh, they make things that are doctrine that was not intended for them but for somebody else completely different. And not knowing where we are in this program is the reason there's so much confusion today. And uh, uh, what is biblically applicable to us today? Uh, it's the reason when we don't understand this, uh, why there are so many different denominations and uh, so many different ways to get to heaven. My goodness, you talk to this church, they say, this is what you do. You talk to that church, this is what you do. Is there not an answer? I believe there is an answer, and it's an absolute truth. There's only one way to get to heaven. And that's through faith in the gospel of Jesus Christ and who he is and what he has accomplished on the cross and the empty tomb. And your faith in that determines whether you're a Christian or not. It's not your baptism, your church membership, your ritual that you went through, or 
trying to keep commandments, whatever it is, it's the faith in the gospel alone. That's the only thing that saves you. And it's amazing how we can get that so confusing to people. And so Romans chapter 15, verse 4 says this here. Romans 15, 4. For whatsoever things were written aforetime or in past time were written for our learning, that we through patience and comfort of the Scriptures might have hope. Uh, like I said, all Scripture is for us. We can get great truth from all of the Bible. Uh, I'm teaching through the book of Matthew. And the book of Matthew is talking about Christ coming and the kingdom was at hand, a literal physical kingdom for the nation of Israel. Uh, I think the ladies' Bible study, they're going through John. And uh, John is a book that tells them why they did not receive that kingdom. Because they came into his own, his own received him not. Because he talks about the spiritual aspect of the kingdom. You have to have faith. He mentions believe more than any other book in the Bible. We have our children. They go through the Bible and they learn Bible stories. And, and uh, about whether it's about uh, Adam and Eve or the flood or uh, David and Goliath or whatever it might be. Uh, all of these things are wonderful for us, but not all Scripture is specifically directly to us. Let me give you an example. Romans chapter 15, verse 8 says this here. Now, I say that Jesus Christ was a minister of the circumcision. When you see that word circumcision, that just means right there, that means to the Jews, to the nation of Israel. So you read that, I say that Jesus Christ was a minister of the nation of Israel because that's what they practice, circumcision, right? For the truth of God, and here on earth he says this, to confirm the promises that were made unto the fathers. That's what's Christ's ministry. He came to this earth and he offered that Jewish kingdom to the nation of Israel. I'd like for you to put up slide one, if you would. You put that up, and you can't see that very well, but uh, you can see it better up there, I guess. That shows you just a little timeline right there. Uh, from Adam to Abraham is 2,000 years. From Abraham to the cross is another 2,000 years. But before the cross, you see there, there's 400 years of silence there. 400 years of silence. And then Christ came on the, on the scene. The reason that silence there, God was judging Israel that they would not hear a prophet or anybody with the word of God. And so there was this period of silence. Christ came on the earth. He died, he rose again, and then the next event, he ascended. He went up on high. And they offered that kingdom. And if Israel would have, would have received that kingdom at that time, they would have gone through seven years of tribulation. You see that there? Seven years of tribulation. And then go into the kingdom. That was promised. And up at the top, when Christ comes back to the earth, he's going to set up his 1,000-year kingdom, and the nation of Israel will be a kingdom of priests, and they will bless all the nations. That is the program, the plan for the nation of Israel. It was promised to them, and is completely for them. That's very, very important, okay? Now, let me say this to you. Christ, while he was on the earth, Matthew chapter 10, verse 5. Matthew chapter 10, verse 5 says this. These twelve Jesus sent forth and commanded them, saying, Go not into the way of the Gentiles. You see that? Don't go in the way of the Gentiles and into any city of the Samaritans. The Samaritan was a half Jew, half Gentile. Okay, enter ye not. That's pretty clear. That's a command. But go rather to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Verse 7 says this, And as you go, preach, saying, The kingdom of heaven is at hand. A heaven on earth, that kingdom we just saw there just a minute ago. That was the message that they were supposed to go to. They were not to go to Gentiles. And by the way, what are you? Okay, that's very important. It states this in Matthew chapter 15, verse 24. But he answered and said, I am not sent but unto the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Who was Christ sent to? To the nation of Israel. And while he was on this earth, he says, you don't go to Gentiles, you only go to the nation of Israel. I've shown people those verses myself. I had one fellow say to me, I see it, but I don't believe it. Isn't that amazing? You see, Christ was a minister to the nation of Israel about the kingdom. And God had promised that when Israel would be saved, then Israel would go to the nation. But first of all, Israel had to be saved. Just that simple. 
We know that Israel rejected Messiah. And yet we have too many people today that keep going back under the Old Testament or back to John 3.16. That's not a bad verse. But it says, God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. That is true. But that's the end result. Up front, at the beginning, Christ came only to Israel for the Old Testament's promise of the king and the kingdom. He promised this in Genesis 12, 3. He said this, And I will bless them that bless thee, and curse him that curseth thee, and in thee shall all the families of the earth, Through who? Through Israel. All the families of the earth could be blessed. Romans chapter 15, verse 12. And again, Isaiah saith, There shall be a root of Jesse, Christ, and he that shall rise to reign. Who's that? Christ. Reign, sitting on his throne in Jerusalem. You know, reigning over Israel and so on. Reign. And he will reign over the Gentiles, and in him shall Gentiles trust. So, the nation of Israel, Christ came. He told him he's the Messiah. If you'll believe in me that I'm the Messiah, then I will set up my kingdom here shortly. The nation of Israel said, no, thank you. But God said, if you will believe as a nation, then you can reach the rest of the world. If you don't, then the rest of the world can't be saved. That was the condition. All of this was pre-programmed by God. Acts chapter 2, verse 22 says this here. And you men of Israel, hear these words, Jesus of Nazareth, a man approved of God among you by miracles and wonders and signs, which God did by him in the midst of you, as ye yourselves also know. Verse 23. Him being delivered by the, what? Say it with me. Determinate counsel and foreknowledge of God... You have taken and by wicked hands have crucified and slain. Not good news. They had slain their Messiah. But you see that? A determinate counsel of God there. In other words, God already had drawn the blueprint before the world began. For the whole 7,000 years of earth's history. That tells me something. Nothing caught God by surprise. Amen? Amen. The nation of Israel rejected Messiah and they sealed it by stoning Stephen in Acts chapter 7. But God still loved us. God had another plan. And it's a different direction. So in Acts, in Matthew, it's talking about go not to the Gentiles but only to the lost sheep of the house of Israel, okay? But since you've rejected me, I have another plan. Now you're going to see the direct opposite of that. In Acts chapter 9, God saves a fellow by the name of Paul. His his original name, Saul, who became Paul, right? He became the apostle Paul. But it's the same God, the same Christ who spoke in Matthew is now speaking to a fellow by the name of Ananias. The apostle Paul. Here he is, he's on the road to Damascus. God knocks him down by a blinding light. Jesus reveals himself to him, and he believes. He said, Lord, what will you have me to do? And Acts chapter 9 is a conversion of the Apostle Paul. We know that because of the blindness, a man has to lead him into the city of Damascus. But God went ahead of Paul into Damascus, and he talked to a fellow by the name of Ananias. Ananias is a law-keeping Jew, a Judaistic Jew, a kingdom believer who believed that Jesus Christ was the Messiah, the Christ, the Son of God. Acts chapter 9, verse 13 says this here. Then Ananias answered, Lord, I have heard by many of this man how much evil he hath done to thy saints at Jerusalem. Verse 14. And here he hath authority from the chief priest to bind all that call on thy name. In other words, Ananias here, he's shaking in his boots. He's nervous about this Saul fella. You see, he's apprehensive about him because he was like Hitler. Uh, He would take him and bound him in prison. He had great authority. But notice what God says to Ananias in verse 15. 
But the Lord said unto him, Ananias, Go thy way, for he, Paul, he is a chosen vessel unto me to bear my name before the... What? Gentiles and the kings and the children of Israel. Wait a minute. Before, don't go to Gentiles. Just go to the house of Israel, the Jews. But now, Israel rejected him. God's got a different program. Now, I want you to go to Gentiles. Romans chapter 11, verse 13 says this here. For I speak to you Gentiles inasmuch as I am the apostle of the Gentiles. Okay? Do you see the vast difference in those instructions? While Christ was on the earth to the nation of Israel... He said, don't go to the Gentiles, just go to your own people. Why? Because Israel has to be saved before they can go to the world. But now, since they've rejected him as Messiah, he's raising up a new apostle with a new program, with a new message. The Apostle Paul. That's so important. Show slide two, if you would. Now, if you can see that a little bit, it's the same as the other, but notice something different. You see the cross... Christ ascended in Acts 7. Israel rejects Messiah, and Israel is temporarily set aside. He saves the apostle Paul. In mid-Acts, the body of Christ begins at that time. You see, after the cross there, Paul's revelation of the mysteries, the church age, and so on, that was not on the other slide because it was a secret. It was a mystery. It was unknown. But after Israel rejected the message of Messiah, God set them temporarily aside and he raised up the Apostle Paul for the body of Christ. One day we will go up in the rapture, the body of Christ, and God will return dealing with the nation of Israel. They'll go into tribulation, Israel will be saved, and then they go into the kingdom, that promised kingdom. Right now today, we're in this church age, this body of Christ. That's where we are today. 90% of Christendom ignores this difference. It's almost impossible to get people out from under the law and kingdom truth. As they study the Bible, they stay only in the Old Testament or the Gospels only and hardly ever teach about Paul. And Paul is for us. Les Feldick said there was a man in the church he knew, this man's pastor. He only preached in the four Gospels. That's all he ever preached in, never in Paul's epistles. And Les said this man went to his pastor, and he showed him this verse, 2 Corinthians 5, 16. Wherefore, henceforth, know we no man after the flesh. Yea, though we have known Christ after the flesh, yet now, henceforth, know we him no more. We don't know Christ after his earthly ministry today because we're not under Christ's earthly ministry today. We're under a new message, a new gospel, the gospel of the grace of God. That's what Paul was saying. This pastor, he read it, then he slammed his Bible shut. He said, I will never believe that. The man said this, but preacher, it's the word of God. The pastor says, I don't care. I will never believe that. Just like most of Christendom today. The God of this world hath blinded the minds of them which believe not. The young man said, fortunately, a little bit later on, the pastor did begin to change some of his teachings and so on. Paul, in that verse there, it's after his conversion. After he had despised Christ so much and God wonderfully saved him, Now, after that, he loves Christ so much, and he writes this. Paul writes this, that we don't follow Christ's earthly ministry. That the twelve who went only to the nation of Israel followed mainly the kingdom program. We today don't follow the kingdom programs being set up on this earth. Ours is completely different. When Christ was up on the earth... Galatians 4.4 4 says this here. But when the fullness of time was come, God sent forth his son made of a woman made under the law. The gospels are still under 
the law. We're not under law, people. We're under grace. Amen? And we need to allow that to sink in our heads and our hearts. Paul's message is completely different. Acts chapter 13, verse 37 says this here. But he whom God raised again saw no corruption, Christ. But, it, but uh, be it known unto you, therefore, men and brethren, that through this man is preached unto you the forgiveness of sins. Now get this, verse 39. And by him all that believe, just believe, are justified from all things from which you could not be justified by the law of Moses. Amen? That's why Paul's message is completely separate from that. But today, even most today of Christendom, they don't like Paul and his epistles. And the result of that, they stay in the Old Testament or only the Old Testament and the Gospels for their teachings, for their doctrines. And as a result of that, churches all around, here's what they have. They, some of them this, some of that, that. For instance, churches today, law-keeping, Legalism, baptismal regeneration, chasing signs and wonders, healings and tongues, health, wealth, ministry, taking over Israel's blessings, the Sermon on the Mount followers, misinterpretations. They only see Scripture devotionally. Did you hear that? That's our country today. They only see Scripture devotionally regardless of who God is speaking to. They write their name right there as if it was written specifically to them. And that's why we have so many churches today that have worked salvation. Amen? I mean, that's just a fact. Remember this, that the same Christ that walked this earth the same Christ that told the twelve to go only to the house of Israel so Israel could rise and be saved is the same Christ that saved and called Paul to preach the gospel to the Gentiles and individual Jews and love him and serve him. The same Christ. 1 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 16, Paul says, Wherefore I beseech you, be ye what? Followers of me, my message. It states in chapter 11, verse 1, it says this here. Be ye followers of me, even as I also am, what? Of Christ. Paul is not saying you don't have anything to do with Christ. It's his earthly ministry you don't have anything to do with. Everything has to do with Christ. Follow me as I follow Christ, as he has revealed himself to us from heaven. Not the earth, from heaven. 1 Corinthians chapter 14, verse 37. If any man think himself to be a prophet or spiritual, let him acknowledge that the things that I write unto you are the commandments of the Lord. What Paul was saying was not just Paul's words. These were the very words of Jesus Christ commanding him, this is what you say. Amen? 1 Timothy 6, 3 says this here, If any man teach otherwise and consent not to wholesome words, even the words of our Lord Jesus Christ, and to the doctrine which is according to godliness. Ephesians chapter 3, verse 3, How that by revelation he, Christ, made known unto me, Paul, the mystery, as I wrote afore in few words. Verse 8, Unto me, who am less than least of all saints, is this grace given, that I should preach among the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Paul. No, no, no. Amen. The unsearchable riches of Christ. Amen. Galatians chapter 1, verse 11. But I certify you, brethren, that the gospel which I preach, of, that was preached to me, is not after man. Okay. Verse 12. For I neither received it of man, neither was I taught it, but by the revelation of Jesus Christ. Christ personally appeared to Paul from heaven and revealed to him this new program, this new mystery program, the gospel of the grace of God that is completely different than the gospel of the kingdom that was to the nation of Israel. And he says, get in the right place in your Bible. That's what Paul is saying. Paul's words were the very words of Christ. Paul started a lot of churches. 
Lots of people were wonderfully saved. Let me say something to you. But the devil is sly. He knows how to put scales and blinders over one's mind and heart. And by the end of Paul's life, 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 15 says this here. When I call to remembrance the unfeigned faith that is in thee, which dwelt first in thy grandmother Lois, and so on, and that's the wrong verse, okay? That's verse 5. I need verse 15. I need to read that, okay? 2 Timothy 1, 15. Here you go. This thou knowest. Now get this. That all they which are in Asia... That was Turkey. That was, uh, what, Ephesus, Philippi. You know, the, the great churches that he started. He said, know this, be turned away from me. Can you imagine that? At the end of Paul's life, the devil had done such a deal with the churches, he kept taking them back under the Old Testament, the old law, the old judicial system of Judaism. God help us not to go there. Amen? Most of Christendom today does that. And by the way, our early church fathers weren't as great as we think they were. Right after Paul was rejected and soon beheaded for his faith, a fellow by the name of Origen raised up. He was very liberal. He introduced what's known as replacement theology. And what that means is that God was all through with the nation of Israel and the Jew. Everything intended for Israel has passed on to now the body of Christ. Let me say something, that's a devil's lie. God's not done with the Jews. He loves Israel. One day, Israel will be saved. We know that from the Bible. Origen uh, also introduced Mariology, the worship of Mary. Another church father introduced infant baptism. They said babies need to be baptized to wash away original sin. Augustine then came on the scene. And he put the seeds of all of Roman Catholicism in. He was the father of that. He brought in a, a method of Bible interpretation called the allegorical method. That tells us that we cannot read the Bible and take it literally, but it always has a hidden meaning underneath and so on. Okay? Augustine did that. And then Luther came on the scene. Luther did turn away from the, from the Pope and says that uh, it's by faith, but he maintained a lot of those teachings of the Roman church. He always constantly referred back to Augustine, the father of Roman Catholicism. He believed in infant baptism, the hierarchy of the church. He believed that when the priests blessed the elements of the Lord's Supper, that they actually became the literal body and blood of Jesus Christ? Huh? He was anti-Semitic. John Calvin came on the scene. He was much of the same. He had very little love. He was very vicious at times, vindictive. There was one man he was upset with that wouldn't agree with his doctrine. He said, when you catch him, I want you to bring him to me. He wanted to personally judge him. And he did. He said, now, they called him one day. He said, I want you to burn him at the stake. But when you burn him at the stake, I want you to burn him as slow as you possibly can. That was John Calvin. The man burned at the stake for 30 minutes before he died. Calvin. He was anti-Semitic, believed in replacement theology. And he himself, his church, tried to start the kingdom himself, himself on the earth. These church fathers were responsible for the slaughter of millions who professed the name of Jesus Christ. These fathers placed the church under the Old Testament and the law and the covenants. That's why it's called today covenant theology. They mixed kingdom, the old message, with body truth. Warren Wiersbe, a lot of you know Warren Wiersbe, he said this, the message of the kingdom given through the Old Testament prophets was replaced by the message of the grace of God revealed in its fullness through Paul. Israel as a nation was set aside and will not be prominent in God's program on earth again until after the church has been raptured. To mix 
kingdom truth and church body truth is to confuse the Word of God and to hinder the work of God. He also said this, Again, let it be said that God never meant for Paul to belong to the twelve. Their ministry was to the Jews and was related to the kingdom. Paul's ministry was to the Gentiles and was related to the mystery of the church, the one body. The twelve received their call on earth because their message presented an earthly hope for Israel. Paul received his call from heaven because his message presented the heavenly calling the church has in Christ. There were twelve apostles associated with the twelve tribes of Israel. Paul was one man, a Jew with a Gentile citizenship, picturing the one body in Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. What we're saying to you is not just some, something pulled out of a hat. These men were the basis of so-called Christendom for 2,000 years, and they ignored Paul. Not all, but the most did. It has been in the past and is today. The mainstream of Christendom for 2,000 years is Jesus' earthly ministry under the law and the Sermon on the Mount, which is actually kingdom living, and reject our Apostle Paul. Please don't forget what we've read. I'm about to... Don't, don't forget what we've read. Acts chapter 9, verse 15. But the Lord said unto him, Go thy way, for he is a chosen vessel unto me to bear my name before the Gentiles. Romans chapter 11, verse 13. For I speak to you Gentiles inasmuch as I am the apostle of the Gentiles. The twelve were the apostles to Israel. Paul was not one of the twelve. He didn't qualify, by the way, to be one of the twelve. To be an apostle of one of the twelve, you had to be there from the beginning of John's baptism. Paul was not there. Paul is the one and only apostle to the Gentiles. Galatians chapter 1, verse 11 again. But I certify you, brethren, that the gospel which was preached of me is not after man. For neither I received it of man, neither was I taught it, but by the revelation of Jesus Christ. And then he states in Galatians chapter 2, verse 2, And I went up by revelation and communicated unto them, the apostles, the twelve, that gospel which I preach among the Gentiles, but privately to them which were of reputation, and so on. Verse 4 says this, And that because the false brethren unawares brought in, and who came privately to spy out our liberty, which we have in Christ Jesus, that they might bring us unto bondage or take us back under the law, to whom we gave place by subjection, no, not for an hour. Why? That the truth of the gospel might continue with you. You see, what Paul's commenting there about, they had a big council at Jerusalem in Acts chapter 15. Paul's message was completely different. And so Paul went up and defended his message that was to the body of Christ. Acts chapter 15, verse 1 says this, And certain men which came down from Judea taught the brethren and said, Except you be circumcised after that manner of Moses, you cannot be saved. That's pretty good Jewish ground there, isn't it? Verse 2, When therefore Paul and Barnabas had no small dissension and disputation, in other words, he had a big argument with them, they determined that Paul and Barnabas and certain of them, other of them, should go up to Jerusalem about the apostles and elders, about this question. And then he says in verse 4, And when they were come to Jerusalem, Paul, to defend his gospel, they were received of the church at Jerusalem, the Jews, the twelve, and of the apostles and elders, and they declared all things that God had done with them. And then verse 5, but there rose up certain of the sect of the Pharisees which believed, saying that it was needful to circumcise them and to command them to keep the law of Moses. So that's what Paul did. He went up there, he defended the gospel of grace that we have today. They say, no, our message was different. You need to follow ours. Paul says, no, I'm not of you. My message is to somebody completely different than you. That's very, very important. And so Paul comments on this in Galatians chapter 2, verse 6. 
But of these who seem to be somewhat, the twelve, whatsoever they were, it maketh no matter to me. God accepteth no man's person. For they, the twelve, who seem to be somewhat in conference, add nothing to, added nothing to me. But contrarywise, when they saw that the gospel of the uncircumcision to the nation of, Israel, uh, to the nation of the Gentiles and so on was committed unto me as the gospel of the circumcision was unto Peter. And by the way, if you don't see two gospels in that verse right there, you're blind. There's a gospel to the nation of Israel, and there's a gospel to whosoever will. Verse 8, For he that wrought effectually in Peter with his apostleship, the same was mighty in me toward the Gentiles. Verse 9, or is it verse 9? Yeah, verse 9. And when James, Cephas, and John, who seemed to be pillars, perceived the grace that was given unto me, they gave to me and Barnabas the right hand of fellowship that we should go unto the heathen and they unto the nation of Israel. Two gospels, two message, went their own way. They, the twelve, and Paul did not preach the same gospel. Do you understand that when you read your Bible? Listen to this verse. Luke chapter 18, verse 31. Then he took unto him the twelve and said unto them, Behold, we go up to Jerusalem. He's going up there to be crucified, people. That's almost at the end of his ministry. And all things that are written by the prophets concerning the Son of Man shall be accomplished. Verse 32. For he shall be delivered unto the Gentiles and shall be mocked and spitefully entreated and spitted on. And they shall scourge him and put him to death. And the third day he shall rise again. That's good news for us, isn't it? Okay. Notice in verse 34. And they understood none of these things. Hello. Listen. They've been with him three years. They didn't know he was going to die. They didn't know he was going to be buried. They didn't know he was going to rise from the grave alive. If they'd known that, if, why were they not at the tomb that third day? Amen? They had no idea Jesus was going to be raised from the dead. And since they didn't know that, how in the world could they preach the same gospel we preach today? Impossible. What can they preach about something they don't know about themselves? John chapter 20, verse 8 says this, They went in also the other disciple, which came first to the sepulcher, and he saw and believed. They, this disciple saw the resurrection when he rose from the dead. For as yet they knew not the Scripture that he must rise again from the dead. They didn't know about this until after the event actually even happened. Amen? Their gospel is repentance, faith, and water baptism. Mark chapter 16. I'm coming down stretch. Pray for me. Mark 16, verse 15. And he said unto them, Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel. Oh, the gospel to every creature. But he explains it the next verse. And he that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. Is that for us today? Of course not. What about Peter after the resurrection? Christ rose. He's in heaven. Peter steps up. He gets 3,000 people saved. They're all Jews, by the way. He says in Acts chapter 2, verse 38, Then Peter said unto them, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the remission of sin. And then you'll receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. Hello, is that today? Of course not. It could not be today. This is where most Christians hang their hat on. That's amazing to me. But remember this, in Acts 2 there, the gospel of grace had not been revealed to the Apostle Paul yet. It was still a mystery. Nobody knew a thing about it until Paul gets saved. Something shocking, Acts chapter 10, verse 44 says this, While Peter yet spake these words, the Holy Ghost fell on all them. This is the first Gentile. Fell on them which heard the word. Faith cometh by hearing, hearing by the word of God, Right? And they of the circumcision, the nation of Israel, the Jews, which believed, were astonished. Now listen to this. Here's Peter. He's still preaching his message. And he gets to the part that Christ, he's the one. He's the Messiah. He is the Christ, the Son of God. He died. He rose from the grave. And the people believed it. And bam, the Spirit of God was on him and in him. Now Peter, being a good Jew, water baptism. He says in verse 47, can any man forbid water that these should... Yeah, you know, Peter, he follows his true... Yeah, I believe he was shocked when this happened. They had already received the Spirit of God. He was already inside of them. 
and they've never been water baptized. Completely apart from the Jewish message. Hello? The body of Christ is never even mentioned until Paul tells of it. The body of Christ. Ephesians chapter 1 verse 22. And hath put all things under his feet, Christ, and gave him to be the head over all things, the church, which is his body. Chapter 4 verse 12. For the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ. You know, you never knew that terminology until Paul mentions the body of Christ, which you're in the moment you get saved today. Amen? Romans 16, 25, I have three or four more, and that's it, I'm done. Romans 16, 25 says this, Now to him that is the power to establish you according to my gospel, and preaching of Jesus Christ according to the revelation of the mystery, which was kept secret since the world began. Colossians 1.25 says this here, Wherefore I am made a minister according to the dispensation of God which is given to me for you to fulfill the word of God. Even the mystery which hath been hidden from ages, from generations, but now is made manifest to his saints. Verse 27, To whom God would make known what is the riches of the glory of this mystery among the Gentiles, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. And then he talks about us that we might be matured, perfect in Christ. What is the gospel for today? 1 Corinthians chapter 15, most people don't know. Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel which I preach unto you, which also you have received and wherein ye stand, by which also you are saved, if you keep in memory what I preach unto you, unless you believed in vain. For I delivered unto you, first of all, that which I also received, how Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, and that he was buried, and that he rose again the third day according to the Scriptures. Amen. That's the gospel that saves. You can go back under the Old Testament and the Gospels, and you can get certain messages, and you'll get confused in there. They do not present that gospel that I just shared with you right there. Paul is the one who revealed the death, the burial, the resurrection of Jesus Christ. I understand that I'm a sinner and I cannot save myself. But I believe that Christ is the Son of God. And that on the cross he died, he shed his blood to pay the sin debt that I owed and they buried him and the third day he rose from the grave alive to justify me. When I believe that and embrace that by faith with my mind and my heart, that's when I become a child of God. And only then do I become a child of God. Romans chapter 10, verse 9, that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus shall believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. For with the heart means you have to mean it. Believeth unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession.